Uh, we are so grateful uh, for each and every one of you, and especially uh, to your stewards and stewardess on today as we celebrate this special day. The word is uh, for them, it's tailored for them, but I believe that if your heart is open, uh, that you will be able to find yourself in this word as well on today. So let us look to the word of God to see what God has to say to us through 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. I thank God for the sister. Uh, that read it uh, for your hearing, and I just want to read a portion of it uh, before we move into the Word of God. First uh, Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, simply says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God. And precious, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, somebody say chief cornerstone, <laughs> a lap precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Let us bow our heads as we prepare to go to God in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you, God, for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, God, for bringing us to this preaching moment. I need you, God. I need your favor, your power, your strength, and your anointing. Not for my name's sake, but for your name's sake and for the sake of your people, oh God. We ask that you would not allow anyone to leave without first hearing from you. We ask, oh God, that you would allow this word to go forth with both clarity and conviction with both power and purpose. We do thank you, God, for the ways in which you will draw us closer to you and compel us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. We bless your holy name and we lift you on high. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. In Jesus the Christ's name, let us all say amen. Come on and clap your hands and just thank God for what he's going to say to you. We will the word on today as we speak from the title, Ignite the Vision. Ignite the Vision. Our passage for today was written by Peter himself. Peter was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Peter was a hot-headed, ear-slashing, former fisherman who came to be acknowledged as the first pope by the Catholic Church. Peter had an interesting journey, and he was one of three disciples uh, that witnessed the transfiguration. He walked on water. He confessed Jesus, and then later denied Jesus. Not one, not two, but if you remember, three times. Uh, Peter's life story is told in the Gospels as well as in the book of Acts. If you remember, it was Peter when the church was birthed. He preached in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 souls were added on that very day. If you remember, it was Peter that had a conversation with Jesus in Matthew 16, and upon his recognition by way of divine revelation, Jesus declared, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus, in essence, was saying to Peter, this was his mission. It was his idea. Jesus was saying, I will put together my church. I will gather a chosen group of people, and nothing will be able to break them apart. I believe somehow that Peter's experiences in Acts chapter 2 and Matthew 16 fueled his experience with writing first and second Peter. He encouraged the church to hope in Christ and to be faithful for Jesus was sure to return. Uh, the hymn writer put it this way, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I believe that he wanted us to understand our power, our privilege, and our responsibility as a part of the church 
of Jesus Christ. It is important to, to note that the church is not just a building put together by brick and mortar. We don't just come to church. We are the church. We are a part of the church local, but we are also a part of the church universal, all believers worldwide, and we are the church individual. The hymn says the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. He goes on to say, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together, all who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. Church is so much more than weekly worship, and we don't just come at one time and leave at another. We are the church, and we take the church wherever we go. The church is still the church, even when we're not holding an official meeting. The church is still the church, even when it's not Sunday morning at 1045. Worship being the church does not end at 1.30 or 2 o'clock when the benediction is announced. We are the church. Somebody say, I am the church. And we have to be ever mindful of this if we are going to ignite the vision for this house in order uh, to be successful. You have to buy into the idea that the vision is more than just words on a piece of paper or words that are visible on a screen. This is not something that you have to do because pastor said so. It is, not, it is something that God has spoken through the pastor and you are charged to obey not grudgingly or hesitantly, but willingly and obediently. We do so because we realize that God did not have to, but he chose to use us to carry out his work on earth as it is in heaven. As the old saints would say, he's God all by himself, and he don't need nobody's help. God can work alone, but because of his love for us, he allows us to journey alongside us, alongside him as his agents, the Bible tells us, as his representatives, and as his ambassadors, in other words, his messengers. So because of his grace, he placed the treasure in earthen vessels. God is counting on you, and God is counting on me, and we are the key to the success of the vision being implemented. So we cannot ignite the vision unless you strike your match. God has wonderful plans for us, plans that are greater than we could ever imagine, even with all that God allowed Jesus to accomplish here on earth. Jesus told the disciples, if you remember, that they would do even greater works. Uh, and in this passage, this passage that we read on today, it helps us to understand our identity as the church and our responsibility in the church. In other words, to make this explanation live for us, he likens our experience with Jesus Christ to a spiritual house built with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and us as the living stone. So let us look quickly to the tools that will help us to successfully build this house. Uh, the first thing that we have to, re have to realize is that we are called. Somebody say, I'm called. The Bible calls us a chosen people. So to uh, be chosen or to be called means that there is a claim on a person's life. It means that they are selected by God. It means that they are summoned by God. It means that you are selected and taken out of circulation from the world. So no longer do we belong to the world. The all sovereign one has beckoned us to work for him. And so we've got to realize that we we are on assignment to build the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. God's will must be done. And we got to realize that out of all of the people in the world, he chose you. He called you by name. God singled you out. We realize I didn't choose this. This chose me. And we've got to be compelled. We've got to have a vote is me mentality. We've got to say if nobody else goes, God, I'm going to go with you. I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I won't turn back. I will go. I shall go to see what the end is going to be. So we've got to know that we were called out. Many other people may have rejected you or 
or be rejecting you right now. It doesn't matter who else has rejected you. God chose you. Your parents may have even rejected you, but God has claimed you. You've got to know that you are God's ambassador, and you have to move according to his agenda. No longer is your life your own. It's not about what you think or feel. It's not about what works best for you. It's not about what's convenient for you. It's not about what just fits into your schedule, because God's calling has claimed your life and your And when people lie on you, because your assignment is to build the kingdom of God and not to build a fan base. I'm not here for likes on friends on Facebook and likes on Instagram. I am not here to build a fan base. I am here to please God and not to please man. That's how I'm getting to the base with people that don't agree that women should be preaching because I know what the Lord spoke to me and I'd rather take my chances being wrong with God than trying to be right with you. So I won't because I know that I'm working for the master. So we're working to build the kingdom, not uh, to build a fan base. We realize that God is our CEO. He writes our performance evaluations and he is the source of our promotion. Just like at work, you don't look to your co-workers for direction or instruction. You look to your boss. And so you don't worry about your co-workers to see what they're doing and to see if they agree with what's going on or to see if they're coming to church on Sunday morning or men we worship during the week. You don't check with them to see if they're coming to the meeting or if they're going to make choir rehearsal. You know that God your boss, and you got to make, be in the approval of the boss. Somebody say I'm married to this work. So we don't join ministries just because our friends are on them. Uh, we we are not here to build social clubs. We're not. Uh, according, uh, we're moving the uh, kingdom agenda forward. It, we can, we got to make sure that church does not become a social club. So you like what I like, so I'm going to join this ministry with you. Or, or you dress like I dress, so I'm going to go over here with you. Or, or, or we shop at the same places, or we drive the same kind of car, so I'm going to come over here to this ministry with you. No, what is God calling to you to do? And where is God calling you to serve? So sometimes we, instead of listening God through the pastor, because God doesn't just speak directly to us, God speaks to the prophet and the priest of the house. Some are trying to carry out their own plans, and they start saying, I, I don't know what the pastor said, but. Some think that they're on ministries because there's status attached to it, but a status doesn't give us validation, it's the calling that gives us validation. Knowing that you're operating in your calling and not your courting. We've got to know where God has called us to be. And we've got to stay there no matter what. It doesn't matter if the building is empty or full. If God has called you to be here, then you stay here. You bloom right where you're planted. Because sometimes when we're good at stuff, people try to court us. Why don't you come on over here with us? Why don't you come on over here to our church? I, I'll make you the leader of this. Or you can be over the praise team. No, I'm not going to let you court me over there because God has called me to be here. So we know when we're operating in our calling and we're fulfilling our purpose, this gives us a, a peace of mind and a sense of joy that's unspeakable. So we've got to uh, uh, seek God concerning clarity in our calling just because you're good at something doesn't mean that it's your gift. Just because that you can sing doesn't mean that you belong on the praise team. Just because you can stand at the door doesn't mean that you're called to usher. Just because you can preach doesn't mean that you're called to pastor. You've got to make, make sure that your voice doesn't overshadow the voice of God. You've got to make sure that you're in the right place because sometimes we want things so badly that our 
desire overshadows God's will for our lives and then our desire ends up becoming a disaster. That's why the Bible tells us to pray earnestly for the best gifts. And when you're open, God will give you what he wants you to have and put you where he wants you to be. And then and only then will the church grow and lives will be changed. We got to make sure that we're moving in the right lanes. We got to make sure that we're moving in the lanes that God has called us to be in. Because if we're operating in the wrong lane, we're going to cause a traffic jam. It's nothing like seeing somebody that drives slow, driving over in the left lane. I'm trying to get where I'm going and I'm trying to get there at the pace that God has called me to move in. And somebody that is over here should be on the right lane doing 45. I'm over here trying to do 65 and they're slowing up traffic. <laughs> somebody look at your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. Look at your other neighbor and say, it's just that simple. <laughs> it's just that simple. Sometimes we make the simple things complex because we're operating in our flesh. It's not that hard. So we got to know that we're called. We're called. Somebody say, I'm called. And then we realize that we are connected. Uh, the Bible talks about living stones being built as a spiritual house. So just as with this physical building, every stone is necessary and every stone is held together because of the stone that lies next to it. So if one stone is missing, it may not be readily obvious, but it will eventually need to be replaced or repaired. For the structure of the building is ultimately at stake. So just as each stone is necessary to the physical building of God's house, we as living stones are necessary to build the spiritual house. So each of us has a necessary part of the whole. The church is the sum of many parts. And each of us here on today make up our part of the church. You are an essential part of the church. You may think uh, that you're just sitting here or you just decide to come here today, but you are an essential part. You are an essential brick in the building of God. And everyone has a role and they should be functioning in that role. And if you don't do your part, if you don't do your work, you won't operate at maximum capacity in the kingdom will ultimately suffer. The hand knows what to touch because the eye helps it to see. We all work together. We are all different parts with different roles, yet the beauty is in the diversity. Wouldn't the church be boring if we all sang? Or wouldn't the church be boring if we all preached? Wouldn't the church all be, be boring if we all just sat there in the pew? Our diverse gifts make way for a diverse experience. The mind ministry was called to mind. I know that I am not called to mind because instead of worrying about God, instead of being focused on nobody being greater than God, y'all will be wondering what I was up there doing because that is not my lane. The people would not be blessed and the glory would not be given to God because I would be up here the way my rhythm is set up. I would be up here bumping into everybody and making a mess. Everybody does it belong on the mind ministry, but the mind will mind and I will preach. The choir will sing. The pastor will pastor. Everybody, as we said, they got to stay in their lane and we got to let people work in their own diversity, in their own individuality. We can't get upset when someone doesn't do something like we think it should be done or like it was done in the past. We got to learn how to receive with love and God placed a piece of him inside of each of us and it manifests differently. But the key is to stay connected. Somebody say stay connected. The pastor, Pastor Broadnax can pastor because he has people to pastor. I can serve because I have people to serve. The choir can sing because they have a congregation to minister to. Each of our gifts is connected to another and somebody is depending on what God has placed inside of you. So if you're absent or 
or out of place, they simply won't get it. That's why we can't afford to just stay home because we feel like it. Because somebody is depending on what God placed inside of you. And you may not be preaching, you may not be ushering, you may not be singing, but God may be placing a word of encouragement in your mouth to encourage somebody along the way. God may be putting a hug in your hands to help to hug somebody and encourage them along the way. So we've got to be where we're supposed to be when we are supposed to be there. Somebody say, I gotta show up. And we've got to work, we got to get this, we got to work in such a way that we're missed when we're gone and not work in such a way that people are glad that we're gone. Some people just come in like a ball of confusion all the time. They blow it up in church like the Tasmanian devil. And it's like you praying they don't show up today. <laughs> the church should not be the same when your stone is missing. So we should have to scratch our heads to figure out who you are and where you are. You should be working in such a way that people know your name. They know what you're called to do. And if you're not being here, if you're not going to be here, you're accountable in not being here. So pastor won't be looking for you and possibly needing you and you're nowhere to be found. It's not enough for you just to have your name on the roll. You have a function and you to be functioning. Somebody say I'm called. And somebody say I'm committed. My babies just came in. Y'all say hey babies. That's Kennedy and Keon over there. I'm Reverend Jerome, but I'm Kennedy and Keon's mommy too. So my babies are here. So we're called and we are connected. But then we also, verse five lets us know that we've got to be committed. So the text talks about offering up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. So when we ignite the vision, we realize that igniting the vision is a commitment and not a convenience. It's not about doing it when we feel like it and staying home when we please. When you realize that you are called to something and that others are connected, then you've got a responsibility to be con committed. Kingdom works and growing the church is a sacrifice. And you've got to work when people are with you and work when you're working alone. You've got to work when people appreciate you and you've got to work when people forget about you. You've got to work when you get a certificate and you've got to work when nobody calls your name. And you've got to work even harder to serve the lovable and serve more so sacrificially to those that are difficult. You've got to choose not to be in and out. You've got to choose not to step up and step down when we are committed to something. We keep moving in it long when the feeling that we felt when we first started has left us. So we never always feel like this. But when we are committed to it, we learn how to press beyond the feeling. So we've got to ask questions like, how can I serve my church? How, not just how can my church serve me? There was a survey that was done a few years ago and it asked uh, how people went about selecting churches. And so they wanted to know, like, how many offerings does the church have? Uh, do they have an exercise class? Do they have a children's church? If you need the exercise, go to the Y. The church is not here to serve you. The church is here for you to serve it. And some people are only around for what they can get. Uh, they choose not uh, to, they choose where they want to go and what they want to do based on if they like something. But we've got to find our calling and make our commitment. We've got to give abundantly. We've got to serve lovingly. And we work not as unto man, but we work as unto the Lord. So even if the sexton of the church doesn't pick up a piece of paper. Your hands work. You can pick it up. And you pick it up not that it's beneath you, but you're picking it up as unto the 
the poor. So this is not just Pastor Broadmax's church. This is our church. And so if I need to bring a little time state because a little kid was eating candy and got some candy on the pew, then I am not above that. I'm going to do what I have to do to make my church better. And your commitment is a sign of your surrender. Of what you're essentially saying is that your life is not your own. You're singing as we sing, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself away. I give myself away so that you can use me. And you are in God's army now. And the last I checked, there's no early retirement or honorable discharge. There's a famous story from Sparta, and a Spartan king boasted to a visiting monarch about the walls of Sparta. The visiting monarch looked around and could not see any walls. He said to the Spartan king, what are these walls in which you boast about so much? The host pointed around at his bodyguard of magnificent troops, and he said, these these are the walls of Sparta. Every man is a brick. So as long as the brick lies by itself, it's useless. It only becomes of use when it is incorporated into a building. So as long as we serve individually, we are really of no maximizing use. But we, if we want to achieve our destiny, we cannot remain alone, but we've got to be built into the fabric of the church. So I ask you as I uh, prepare uh, to close this message, if your relationship with God, if your relationship to the work that God has called you to do were a house, what would that house look like? Would the house be intact? Would it get the rest of necessary renovations and upgrades and updates? Would it follow the code in order to not be in violation? Or would the, would the shutters be falling off? Would the paint be chipping off the walls? Would the doors be off the hinges and the carpet be stained? If your relationship to the work that God has called you to would be a house, what would that house look like? That is something that I can't answer. That's something that you've got to answer in the cracks and crevices and the recesses of your own mind. You may be able to fool everybody else, but you can't fool God. I love you all. Remember that play back in the day? Your arms are too short to box with God. And so you can do some homework this week now, please go. You've got some questions not to ask everybody else, but you've got questions to ask yourself. It's easy to put up the magnifying glass and look at everybody else, but Michael Jackson talked about that man in the mirror. So we're, not, we're gonna put down the magnifying glass and stop worrying about what the Sister Cantaloupe and Brother Watermelon are doing. I don't want to use any real names in case anybody thought I was trying to shoot a shot. <laughs> but we are looking, as the song says, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So we want to ignite the vision of the kingdom of God through Mount Pisgah AME Church. 
you got to strike the match. And you strike it through realizing that you're called. You strike it through realizing that you are committed. And you're striking it and you realize that you are connected. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word on today. We thank you for the ways in which it cut us, it convicted us, it challenged us, and compelled us to be better men and women in you. We ask first, God, for you to forgive us. Because we haven't always obeyed you. We haven't always done what you asked us to do when you asked us to do it. If we're honest with ourselves, some of the things that we know you've asked us to do, some of the things that we hear you calling our name for, we've excused ourselves out of it. So forgive us, Lord. Creating us a clean heart, renewing us a right spirit. Do a new thing within us on this day. We thank you for a fresh wind, a fresh fire, and a fresh faith. We thank you for a revival in our relationship with you. I lift up those on today that feel far away from you. Remind them that you're never too far away from them, oh God. Those that feel abandoned, rejected, or useless, God, remind them that your word says that you know the plans that you have for them. Plans to prosper them and give them a future and a hope and to bring them to an expected end. So we pray, oh God, that you would stir up the gift that is within us in the name of Jesus. That you would give us the courage and the boldness and the commitment to walk worthy of the calling, to guard that which is entrusted to our care, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for how the kingdom will be better. We thank you for how our pistol will be better. We thank you, God, for how our homes and our jobs and our neighborhoods will be better as a result of us no longer bending our yes. We say yes to you today, oh God, not just with our lips, but also with our lives. We lay our lives down at the altar, and we trust in you to pick them up and to use them to the good pleasure of your will. In Jesus the Christ's name, we pray that everybody say amen. Come on and clap your hands and thank God for the word. Thank you, Mr. Jacob, for the word of the day.